stages of a hazmat response. Chemical leaks. All that good stuff. Here's how they flow. Here they go. Here we go. All right, so now we got to, you decide to have a hazmat team and you got some kind of chemicals. It could be any kind of chemical at your location. And first thing you got to do is you got to figure out what a response is. To me, a response is there's an evacuation number in your emergency action plan of when you're going to evacuate your floors. This is for any chemical, any right? Chemical. So any chemical. This is you're, not you're supposed just... to in your EAP already address what chemicals you have and how you're going to yeah. manage those and when to evacuate. So That's from first a, thing. From a food plant. This is, we should have this for CO2. We should have this for nitrogen. Sanitation we chemicals. We should have this for sanitation chemicals. We should have it for ammonia. Yep. Those it are the be top addressed. ones. Yep. All right. So now we have, we've got a chemical. We're going to evacuate. Now we've got to go do something. And we have to define what that something is when this plan is going to kick in. If it's a cleanup and kind of calling somebody, then maybe this plan doesn't kick in. But if we're going to start putting on gear and start dealing with the leak and start turning off valves or doing an offensive attack, you're in a full hazmat mode at that moment. That's, yep. Something spilled or leaked yep. it shouldn't have, and I've got to put gear on. Yeah, I'm not talking about draining oil pod. I'm not talking about doing line break where it's, where it's normal. I'm talking about it, gets, yeah. it starts getting crazy. Yeah, this is not maintenance tasks. This is right. if a maintenance task goes terribly goes wrong, wrong, maybe. <laughs> but, Absolutely. But, you, know, you do a line break, and you do it fine. It's not going to happen do a line it just break, comes out real quick. You do a line break on the wrong side. Well, now you got a problem. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where, so first thing, you have to break down your location when your team is going to be activated, yep. when you're going to have a response. And that yep. includes internal, external. All right. The second one we're going to look at is now it's inactive. So basically, you somebody say, called, so you said take, we got a problem. We did an investigation. We put the plan in place. Right. So basically, you have a bell curve. So you've mm-hmm. got like for ammonia, it'd be zero to 25. We yep. evacuated 25, so at 25, our teams start kicking in. Yep. Now we're going to have masks, meters, doing tasks. We're going to do whatever that is in our corner of our plan. And then we're going to do that up to a certain level, and then we're going to change our gear again. But the thing yep. you need to know is it has to be chemical specific. It can't just be chemical liquid or vapor. It can't be in a room or out of room. It's got to be the way that chemical lives. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. I am not going to use the same protocols for nitrogen or CO2 that I use for ammonia. Right. They are both, both can be in a liquid form and they can be in a vapor form. And they both can be hard to breathe. Yes. So, but they have different levels. And so what it really boils down to, it deals with the ideal H for that specific chemical because chlorine is different again. And the the chemical itself. So for example, uh, Jan had a leak a few years ago. She was working as an IC while she was pregnant and it was a liquid leak, but it wasn't a chemical that usually gases off crazy. But they still had to wear different things they would normally wear based on the chemical. So that's it. It's not just liquid or vapor automatically parts per million. It's got to be based on the chemical where it's stored. You got to understand yeah. all that. And, and so the reason why he brings up that I was also pregnant at the time is because we hear a lot of times providing training and acknowledging that we're having a response happen and that we are having a team is scary. And we just say that part to be, it shouldn't be. If it's scary, we're, it if right. it's scary, we're doing yeah. it wrong and we're not drilling enough. Now, there are people that say we have different levels of PPE we're going to wear at different stage. And we'll talk about it here in a second. But the thing you need to know is it's, it's not about the levels. It's the physical way it, it goes to your body. It's not a number. So to tell me that something reacts to me at 4,000 or 5,000, whatever. What I want to know is when did my skin start burning? Because that's when I got to start wearing different levels of PPE. Yeah. When am I ha- causing harm to the employee? Yeah. And that is different per person. Absolutely. So so I've I mean, got to think is. of that. I got to put that buffer in place. All yeah. right. So now my number one is I've got to figure out I'm going to respond and when I'm going to actually do it. Number two, now I got to start getting my gear and decide liquid vapor where it is. What am I going to wear? Now, number three is now I'm going to put some gear on. So now am I going to wear level B or level A or level C? Whatever, whatever grade it is. Yeah. But, now, I want to say disclaimer. <laughs> What we're getting ready to talk about is our opinion. Our opinion. I understand there are people out there who have a different opinion and want to go a different path, and that's fine. This is based on our experience of what works in the field over a whole bunch of different events. So, So for example, I saw a few days ago a location tell me that 5,000 parts per million, they wear particular gear. And I'm like, okay, but I wear that gear at 300 parts per million. Now, I can justify why I wear 300 because I've done so many live events. I can see how it moved and worked. And mm-hmm. I asked him, well, how, where'd you get the number from? And that's the other thing. Whatever gear you decide to wear, 
or wherever you buy or whatever you, you have to be able to justify why that number is real. 5,000 for most of my chemicals, except for CO2 in a room. Yeah. If it was 5,000 ammonia or 5,000 chlorine or 5,000 of my sanitation chemicals, it's going to be burning and hurting me. It's it's completely different response than well, what we're talking about. So. Well, I'm going to tell you, Joe and I have both been exposed to ammonia while we've been doing training. And other chemicals, actually. And, and so. other, yeah, and other chemicals, too. Yeah. While we've been doing training, a leak has happened just by happenstance, but not really because we're in a plant almost every day yeah. and they happen all the time. Yeah. But I will tell you, I had problems at a number that was significantly less than 5,000. Yeah, so. <laughs> and you've got to think about what kind of skin is exposed. You can have 100. In the different types of equipment and gear that you're putting on. So in a level B, I may still have necklines and stuff That's exposed correct. because it's not vapor protective. Right. So if I, I take ammonia, for example, I start wearing level A's at 300 because it's vapor. I'm just going to do that. And I may wear it lower if I think it's going to be crazy in the room. But well, it could get worse really fast. Yeah. So if I'm going in to do a task and that task turns off a particular valve and that valve has tendency to get crazy, I may just go level because I don't want to worry about it. Well, there's also the concept of you have no idea what it's been doing since you... 20 minutes getting ready stop, or yeah, 40 you, minutes or whatever it is. How long does yeah. it take you to do the response and actually make entry into the, the hot zone? A lot of things could have happened by then. And if you crack that door and you're like, whoa, it's that's too much. That's, yeah. too, that's too much. Well, now you have to go back and change gear and get redressed. Yeah. And, so that's a waste of time. Now other, it's still leaking. What are we doing? If you listen to other episodes, I don't want the leaks to go over an hour, basically. I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want to lose any product. And I don't want to hurt the community. So that's my first rule. So if I have to decide PPE and I decide, I look at the room we're going into. And if we're going in a room and it's set chemical number one, and I know that chemical well, I may change my PPE because I've, I've dealt with those. And I know I don't want it to keep going for hours. I want to get it done. Well, I think part of it's also having more gear is like scary. And I'm like, I, I, I wear I, level A's a lot, so whatever. I, mean, I, I like you know, level whatever. A's personally. I'm more comfortable in them as opposed to level B's. I think they get really hot. I'm so. also a little claustrophobic. So I actually do better in A's, which is yeah. weird, but I don't like the tape as much on the gloves. Yeah, everything's so. all taped in all right. here. So anyway, so but, but you need to decide that. Now, I will tell you, as Jen said, people have different opinions about it. We're only telling you what we saw for real. because What works all the time. That's, that's it. No matter what. Yeah, weather, we've got to crewing. Do this in weather and rain and snow. Yeah, so I'm just telling you, you got to break that through. down. You got to break down the PP and what you're actually going to wear or not. And don't get caught up in someone telling you who's not going to be doing it. So yeah. if, they've, if they've never fought that chemical, don't let them tell you. Because we don't. I don't give you advice on chemicals I don't manage. I'm yeah. like, that's not my, I have to that's know not that's my, my limit. That's not that's my not lane. Not. So. Yeah. If people give you advice, I think it's fair to always ask, how do you know? Yeah. How many have you done? Well, have you done it personally? Yeah. There's a, there's a fair. lot of, there's a lot of entities out there who train in this world. But have never done never a response. Yeah. I'm only telling you we fought for real and what happened real time. I can't speak for anything else. All right. Yep. So then the, the number four here is we got to release the floor sometimes. So what you have in is my got, favorite you part. Got, <laughs> you got this part where you're you're going up and this thing's getting a little crazy. So you're wearing some gear and you then you add gear. some more gear. And now you've got the crazy over, but it's still bad. We stopped the leak, the spill, whatever it is. Basically, basically we turned off the garden hose in the living room, but there's still water everywhere. <laughs> Great analogy. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> we still got it. There's still water, and if it's a, it's if it's a chemical gives off vapor, you still got vapor. Yeah. The leak may not be going, but the, but there's still a lot going on. So just as a note, usually this is the point the fire leaves. So yeah, the have, rest of this, you're on your own. Yeah, this could be literally yeah. four or five days. So the, we've the, had to do. The, so here we go. This is not so, clean up though. No, no we're, we're still in the trying to release the floor to even get we're not clean running. up in there. We're not running yeah. yet. Okay, so here here's here's kind of the, the list, list of things that go on when you're trying to release the floor back to normal operation. So you're going to have to vent it out. And this could be for a while based on what your airflow is. If I'm having a leak in my blast freezers, that is completely different than I'm having a leak in my compressor rooms where or I have outside. built it built in ventilation and I can yeah. open garage doors and everything else. So Based on where this was in your facility, the ventilation time could be a couple hours. It could be days. So you've got to kind of plan for that and figure out what's going on. We're taking meteor readings and we're going in and basically doing sweeps of the area to see how we doing. And we're doing and those people have got to be in gear. We've got to figure out what we're going to do with all the contaminated stuff. So we got to be calling people that can come and pick it up if we've got a service for that. We've got to be making sure that we're rotating those crew members because, again, this could be we're in a second shift, next shift, third shift. We could be 24 hours. I can't keep an incident commander for 48 hours straight without letting him go home. So this is the moment that you find out, did we train enough ICs? Because if I've still got people in a place that's got bad air and they're wearing gear that has to be under incident command because of 
all the medical things and liability going on there. So we've got rotating crews, transferring command. We've got to render out product. If it's contaminated and saturated with whatever the, the spill was or the chemical was, they may have to be wearing masks to be able to render out that product, which means yep. it may not be your rendering folks. It may end up being part of your hazmat team Could, members doing that. And then you've got sanitation you may bring in. We've got sanitation. And now you've got to decide, well, how low can the levels be before we start introducing sanitation chemicals? Because we don't want to have another evacuation triggered. That has happened in the past. Now we got all kinds of problems. We start over from scratch. Then we've got to make sure that if we've got contractors in there, because again, this could be going on over several days. Do they have the right kind of training, fit tests, physicals? Can they wear gear? Did they bring a mask? Validate the insurance piece and all that stuff. That's all going on. So all of these return to normal operations steps based on the chemical we're talking about, those should be in the return to normal section under your EAP. And if you've got questions, reference episode 31, where I break down in detail all of this information of how to structure your EAP, which includes this section as Our well. Our episode four talks about some of this. If you yep. want to go back and listen to that, a little more details. Yep. So, and again, if this is not covered in your incident command training, and this is not covered in your hazmat tech training, then we still have to get the data out there and, and train our folks on what we expect them to do. Right. If, if I'm trained on EPA or rail car or whatever guidelines there are, but I've never been trained on the chemical of my plant, I still can be trained on the chemical of my plant. I still can be trained on the levels and the gear I'm going to wear for my chemical and how to do it. Yeah, yeah. So... All right, so you can see us on social media. You can see some of these live responses and drills and all kinds of really cool stuff that we may post on there about different articles and some photos from our training that we do. And so you can find us, Allen Safety LLC is our handle on TikTok, on Instagram, Facebook. You can find us there. Otherwise, Joe and I are both on LinkedIn. You can connect with us there, Joe Allen, Jen Allen. And hopefully I'm seeing you at IAR. It's in March, Orlando. Visit me. I'm speaking Monday. So hope to see you there. Come say hi and ask whatever questions you got. And that's it for this week. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a safe week. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you're looking for more in-depth discussions or step-by-step -step solutions on all of the different safety and regulatory topics, please visit us at www.allensafetycoaching.com for web-based virtual coaching and training or at www.allen-safety.com to book our team for on-site services, training sessions, to order merchandise, to learn more about our team and what services we provide in the field, or just simply to request a topic for us to cover on our next podcast. If you found today's podcast helpful and would like to support our podcast further, please help us by subscribing, liking, and sharing this podcast with anyone that could benefit from the information we cover here as that helps us to continue to put out this free content. Thank you so much for your support.